Quick question. How much of North America is made up by the United States? Today, the United States is roughly 3.8 million square miles, and North America as a whole is 9.54 million square miles, which means that, put that over that, carry the one, Today, the United States is around 39% of North America by land mass. And that's a huge slice of pie, but it wasn't always that way. There's a strong tendency in discussions of early American history to focus on the British colonies. But as we already know, the US is only a fraction of the space we're exploring. Even in 1776, the United States wasn't the biggest player in North America. At that point, the colonies were just 4% of North America. Huge swaths of land, north, south, and west of the Atlantic coast, were still inhabited and controlled by indigenous Americans. And that's exactly who we're focusing on in this episode. Today, we're taking a look at indigenous American culture, influence, and power in the 18th century. I'm Dr. Danielle Bainbridge, and this is Study Hall U.S. History to 1865. <music> We already know that when the Europeans arrived in North America, they didn't wash ashore in some empty wilderness. There were people here, lots of people. In the 17th and 18th centuries, the indigenous peoples living in North America had a major leg up on the Europeans. That's because they were here for a long, long time before the Europeans and continue to live and thrive here to this day. Indigenous groups controlled access to waterways for trade and fertile land for farming. The sheer size of their populations also made them decisive factors in imperial wars. And different tribes and groups interacted with Europeans differently. That's because, as we've talked about, the various indigenous peoples who lived in North America were complex. Some groups were large with extensive trade networks. Others were smaller, united by a shared language or culture. The indigenous people in North America at this time were incredibly diverse, and we do them a disservice when we try to treat them as a monolith. So let's keep that in mind as we take a tour around the continent to see how some of these different indigenous people responded to the invasion of European colonists. Some tribes established their own political dominance in response to attempts to colonize their land. For example, our old friends, the Haudenosaunee, developed political alliances with the British in upstate New York. The Haudenosaunee is a group of five and later six indigenous nations. As we talked about in our episode on the Northeast region, they were also known as the Iroquois Confederacy. But despite being made up of different nations, the Haudenosaunee were not a large number of people. In fact, their total population was around 12,000, with roughly one-sixth able to fight if war broke out. So, knowing they couldn't win a war against a far more populous British foe, the Haudenosaunee instead turned to diplomacy. By making their disdain for France's indigenous allies clear through devastating raids in the mid-17th century, the Haudenosaunee essentially showed their loyalty to the Dutch and later the British. In exchange for this political loyalty, both colonies more or less left the Haudenosaunee alone. The British and the Haudenosaunee also agreed to a covenant chain, a complex series of treaties and alliances that dealt with many aspects of life for both sides. The British were just as dependent on this alliance as the Haudenosaunee. So when one of the nations that made up the Iroquois Confederacy announced the chain had been broken, the British knew they had to act fast. To get the Haudenosaunee back on their side, several British colonies sent a delegation to meet up with the Haudenosaunee and firm up their loyalty in 1754. It was a critical meeting because the French and Indian War broke out just two years later. And though they started off neutral, the Haudenosaunee soon came in on the side of the British. The Anishinaabe, a group from the Great Lakes region, did things a little differently. The Anishinaabe didn't have a big organized confederacy like the Haudenosaunee. Instead, they kept their group small and adaptable to regional changes in power. That adaptability was the key to the Anishinaabe. They could be lean and small when needed, but through their dense interior network, they could also become a formidable military force. This allowed them both to display force to the French, but also be adaptable enough to negotiate where they engaged the French. Speaking of the French, the Anishinaabe had what the French traders desperately wanted, beaver pelts and fur. Due to their prime location near the Great Lakes, the Anishinaabe could dictate terms of trade, which they used to their advantage by developing close trading ties with the French. They even later fought alongside them in the French and Indian War. It is important to note, however, that if the French had the power and resources to dominate the Anishinaabe, they would have. 
Where European colonizers had power, they exerted it without care for indigenous alliances or even their own treaties. The Anishinaabe tribes and clans didn't always operate as one unit, and one group in particular played an outsized role, the Odawa. Before the French arrived in the region, the Odawa controlled a strategic point in northern Michigan between Lake Huron and Lake Michigan. This spot controlled access to the Atlantic as well as the American interior. So the Odawa were in a great spot. And when the French did arrive, the Odawa expertly shifted their alliances, playing England and France against one another while benefiting from trade with both. But the French weren't the only ones entering a pre-existing web of trade and conflict. Say hello again to Spain. In the West, mainly present-day Texas, the Spanish were surrounded on all sides by indigenous tribes. There were the Caddo in the East, the Wichitas and Comanches in the North, and Apaches to the West, and more. The Spanish settlers who did live in Texas were not as flamboyant as their wealthy countrymen in Mexico City. In fact, they lived more like their indigenous neighbors. As a result, indigenous peoples here weren't initially concerned by European settlement. That's because the far more important threats to the region came from other tribes. Conflicts over land and trade existed well before the Spanish arrived. Even further west, life wasn't much different. These lands were known as Comancheria and Apacheria after the Comanche and Apache tribes that lived there. They controlled massive amounts of land, set up political formations in the areas they conquered, and were united by common cultures. But the indigenous populations in Comancheria and Apacheria didn't quite look like European empires. For example, these groups were still organized by kinship and familial systems, not by one far-off monarch. But like an empire, the Comanches and Apaches controlled the land and used their power and culture to keep the region under their influence through raids and trade. They were so good at controlling through raiding and trading that it wouldn't be until the 19th century that the Apache and Comanche would lose control of the region. In the southeast, another group of tribes thrived. The Mississippi River was hugely important to trade and access to the American interior. That's because rivers were the 17th and 18th century versions of a highway. But European powers didn't control the critical rivers in the 17th and 18th centuries. Indigenous tribes did. And not just one tribe. The Osage, Mississippians, Quapaws, Cherokees, Shawnees, Missouri, Illinois, Iowas, and more were all centered around this river network. The Mississippi River was a hub of indigenous culture. Think of it like our earlier discussion of Cahokia. Many different indigenous groups all gathered along the Mississippi River to engage in trade, build alliances, and resolve conflicts. And when Europeans started showing up along the river, the indigenous peoples controlled who got access. The Europeans weren't building their own trade networks. They were simply using ones already in place. Unfortunately, the privilege wouldn't be extended back to the indigenous peoples. When Americans took control over the region in the early 19th century, these same tribes were forcibly removed from their land, and enslavers began to take their place. Speaking of removal, things were rarely peaceful for tribes who encountered Europeans. Though many tribes integrated Europeans into trade networks or existing conflicts, we also have to remember that millions of indigenous peoples died from warfare, enslavement, forced relocation, disease, massive cultural disruptions, and far more. That left the survivors to try and pick up the pieces of their lives elsewhere. After the French were defeated in the Seven Years' War in 1763, many indigenous people in the Great Lakes region were suddenly without an ally. The British, who took France's place, weren't as interested in simply joining the indigenous trade networks. They wanted control over the region and trade. And when they got that control, they often left the existing tribes out. Even worse, the British limited the sale of weapons to indigenous people, which hurt their ability to hunt. Neolin was a Leni Lenape prophet who urged other indigenous peoples to eliminate their connections with the Europeans, especially consuming alcohol. Pontiac, on the other hand, took Neolin's message and turned it into a military strategy. 
He saw the growing threat of Britain in the Ohio Valley and Great Lakes, so Pontiac tried to unite the local tribes against Britain. This culminated in Pontiac's rebellion in May 1763, which lasted three years and saw the indigenous fighters capture eight of Britain's 11 forts in the Ohio Valley. But while Pontiac gets all the credit, the reality is a little different. The British were a threat to everyone, not just Pontiac. In fact, it was the British who tried to pin the blame on Pontiac. The tactic of pinning a rebellion on one individual was designed to downplay how far-reaching the resistance actually was. So while Pontiac might have been the face, countless other tribes united against the British. It was this backdrop that led Parliament to draw a boundary line over the Appalachian Mountains. Everything to the west was designated Indian territory, and they forbade settlement by colonists. The Royal Proclamation actually angered many colonists, who wanted to expand further west. In fact, it's one of the colonial grievances against the British leading up to the American Revolution. But I'm getting ahead of myself. While pan-Indianism was ultimately unsuccessful in ridding the indigenous communities of British settlement, it drove home one hugely important point. The indigenous populations here were diverse. Contact and colonization fundamentally changed things for indigenous and European people alike, but in most of what would become the continental United States, indigenous groups were the most powerful entities for centuries. Would American history be the same without Pontiac and Neolin, whose actions contributed to the American Revolution? Or the Anishinaabe, who played a huge role in the French and Indian War? In order to fully understand colonial history, we must also understand it as indigenous American history. At every turn, indigenous peoples played a role in determining the direction of American history. They weren't minor background players, they were the players. We shouldn't forget that, even as we shift focus now to the British and French conflicts in North America. We'll talk about how European affairs played out in North America in the coming episodes. Thanks for watching Study Hall U.S. History to 1865, which is part of the Study Hall Project, a partnership between ASU and Crash Course. If you like this video and want to keep learning with us, be sure to subscribe. You can learn more about Study Hall and the videos produced by Crash Course and ASU at the links in the description. See you next time.